in the meantime, I'll just uh, go ahead and introduce myself and uh, you all can do the same. Maybe you, you want to go first since your name is... Yeah, hello everybody. My name is Juha Kosonen. I work in Nokia Mobile Networks as a software architect. Yeah, hi, I'm Ajay Simha. I'm an NFV architect at Red Hat. Uh, I, um, I work in the group with, that produces all the reference architectures and uh, I focus on uh, NFV reference architectures. All right, uh, today we are going to share with you our experience in um, uh, DPTK um, troubleshooting. Although it says troubleshooting, I know like uh, some of you um, at least may not have the, you know, kind of architectural background of how DPTK works. So we'll start off with that and uh, then go on to, um, you know, these are things that we exp expect to uh, for you guys to walk away with. One is to get an overview, overview of DPDK and what can go wrong in uh, DPDK installation and how to troubleshoot that. And uh, lastly, the tuning of DPDK, which is very critical for you to get a high performance. And uh, you know, uh, what are the things that you can and should do to get high performance and how to look at stats because uh, DPDK, once your interfaces are in DPDK, it's no longer in kernel, so you cannot do like uh, uh, IP link show, your links won't show up and so on. So we're gonna show you, uh, you know, important and cool commands that you can execute on, uh, on uh, Red Hat Linux. So this is the agenda, we're gonna walk you through the kind of, uh, how we got here, what are the telco requirements, because DPDK uh, is, is, a, is a, you know, data plane development kit is, is a method for you to get high throughput, which is like um, most of these requirements came from uh, network function virtualization, and that is kind of the main driver or motivator for uh, developing things like SRI or VE and DPDK. So we're gonna talk about the telco requirements at a high level, uh, then talk about like journey to DPDK, how we got there from all the way from Vert.io, uh, talk about uh, the data, DPDK in the data plane, which is going to be like hardware tuning, what needs to be done there, uh, how do you get the throughput, what kind of throughput can you expect using DPDK, and uh, CPU core allocation, high availability, um, we're going to talk about high availability um, just at a high level, but we're going to talk about that because it's uh, really important. And uh, lastly, uh, even though the title says DPDK troubleshooting, the last section focuses on troubleshooting and uh, various aspects of it, which is the inst what can go wrong in install time, what you should do and what can go wrong, what does it look like in a HA environment, and lastly, the performance related stuff. So getting to the telco requirements, there are basically two major pillars. Although, you know, telcos, service providers, operators, whatever you may call them, they'll always come back with, uh, you know, we have, I'm sure, a uh, lot of them, a lot of us in that room, I, I consider myself telco because I used to, I've been working in service providers since 1998. Um, so a lot of uh, service providers will say, you know, these are the two major things, which is, first is uh, two pillars, which is high availability, and the other one is performance. But then again, they may come back and say, I also need, by the way, service assurance, I need that, I need billing, other things also. Everything is equally important, but these two are the most important. Um, so we have heard of situations where like uh, uh, telcos are talking about like, oh, we do not want to uh, set aside like a node to do control function only because we want to get maximum throughput, meaning the number of CPU cores that we allocate, we want subscriber, equate that to number of subscribers who are paying for it. So it's that, you know, that's how detailed they get with, uh, you know, trying to get a ROI on this. Um, so first of all, maximum subscribers per core, how, how do you get that? Uh, how do you get high availability, uh, like as close to five nines as possible? Because here, remember we have like a tiered, Architecture, it's like you have your data center at the bottom, the hardware, and then on the top of that you have the uh, network function virtualization infrastructure, which is typically OpenStack in our case. 
And then on the top of that, you have the VNF. So the high availability is kind of actually um, tiered. So you, you cannot get high availability unless you have uh, your kind of uh, some sort of uh, uh, cohesive uh, method with, uh, from the top to the bottom of the stack. Um, again, high availability, even though we are talking about troubleshooting and performance, Without HA, I mean, if you have no high availability, if your node goes down, your like failure means zero packets per second. So let's remember that. So that's why it's always important to think about high availability. Um, telco applications and uh, services typically serve millions of subscribers. When I mean, we may not realize this, but like uh, when we uh, talk about a mobile operator, even the small ones are talking about like you know tier two, tier three are talking about like you know, 8 million subscribers and 10 million subscribers, and it can be higher. So what used to happen is the hardware-based solution used to provide them these things because they used to have, you know, multiple refrigerator size boxes, to, you know, having uh, dedicated ASICs and hardware doing exactly what needs to be done to get the acceleration and the high availability. So now we need to try and get that in a virtualized environment, right? How do you get that in a virtualized en environment as much performance as we uh, can get? And we need to get that the maximum packets per second without having drops, ideally. With drops, you, I, I'll show you a chart where uh, you know we'll, sh uh, we'll share some uh, testing done by our larger team, which does uh, performance testing. I will, I will share that information with you, uh, and you can see that with when you have drops, like even though it's minuscule, you can get like much uh, higher throughput. And without drops, uh, you know zero packet loss, the PPS is going to reduce obviously. Um, Network equipment providers, uh, you know, people who provide the VNFs, as well as the telcos, uh, have kind of like uh, tried to move away from solutions which depend where the VNFs will depend on the hardware, has any dependency, right? The reason I bring this up here is SRIOV works great. You get like fantastic throughput. The only problem with that is really that the VNFs and the drivers for the NIC are tightly coupled. So if the VNF like vendor goes, moves forward, or more typically the operator or service provider goes and changes the hardware, then the VN, there has to be a kind of like a dialogue between these guys saying like, hey, I changed this, thing is not working anymore. And not working and those kind of things are not you know, something that is tolerated in a telco environment. Typically even like, you know, if you have outages, they have to report beyond a certain uh, like seconds or like minutes per year, you have to report it to FCC, at least in North America. So it's a pretty serious affair to uh, have all these things, you know, working all the time. Uh, so ideally they want to get to, uh, many of the operators, uh, service providers that I've talked to want to get as closely, close to the cloud-ready model as possible. So they're willing to get, they go for the flexibility um, while sacrificing a little bit of the performance. Again, just like, uh, uh, oops. Uh, this is like a, a kind of a kind of a gotcha because you know they may say we'll uh, we're willing to sacrifice the some performance, but then you'll realize like they want more performance later on. So it's always a game catching up game where technology is trying to catch up and give you more and more packets per second. Um, yeah, and then let's take a quick uh, overview about the playground where VNFs are, are living. So this is a picture of, of Nokia airframe solution. Um, uh, on the right hand side, there's, there's a VIM layer, uh, which in, in the Nokia case, uh, also VMware is supported there. Uh, and then there's a hypervisory layer, and all of this is uh, operating on top of the data center hardware. So, and on top of that is the actual VNFs, and those VNFs may have then uh, certain requirements, all, all of which are not uh, exactly the same on the, all, all the VNFs, but are probably, and in many cases, uh, there are in common that the high th throughput in, in terms of n network as well as latency is required. Uh, 
For example, this is true in case of radio and, and, and core cases. So there, there we see these terms like uh, real-time capability and, and throughout needs to be optimized. Uh, and the DPDK is one approach uh, to meet these challenges. Thank you, Yuva. Um, so now we'll, let's talk about like the journey from Vertio all the way to DPDK, how we got here, right? So when, when people started thinking about uh, NFE initially, it was all Vertio and the performance was, you know, uh, considerably low. You, you could easily get like maybe 600 to 800, uh, you know, Mbps out of a 10 gig link. It won't matter. It's just like not acceptable from a, a NFE telco point of view. So that's what like you have two NICs, 10 gig NICs in this, in this whole uh, scenario that I'm going to paint for you. And out of that you have the, you know, first of all you have all these like hypervisor and layering. Uh, there was actually one like, you know, older uh, OpenStack documentation that showed that there was seven plus layers before like a packet from all the way from the VM. Like if you think about egress all the way until it makes it out of the, uh, the physical NIC or the PNIC. So that was like ridiculous, right? So things started improving, even OpenStack made modifications. It was not layered so many uh, places, but still the performance of Vert.io in, in its native form is not good enough. So then um, the next stage was, uh, you know, uh, people who in NEP started saying, okay, we need to get as much throughput out of a 10 gig as possible because you know, uh, you're setting aside a one whole server, like to do certain functions, you need to get throughput out of every single 10 gig as possible so that you can get the, uh, you know, uh, 40 gig, 60 gig, 100 gig uh, throughput out of the whole box. So this is a PCI pass through. The PCI pass through, the issue is, if you look at, uh, you have two VNFs, VNF1 and VNF2. VNF1 has got Ethernet zero and VNF2 has Ethernet zero. But the 10 gig is going to be completely dedicated to the VNF1 because that's how PCI pass through works. You take, uh, you know, basically the hypervisor takes the, you know, the characteristics of the 10 gig, presents it to, uh, you know, the NICs, and one of the NICs, I mean, the, the uh, Ethernets on the uh, VNF or the virtual machine, and that started, you know, VNF1 uses that, and that's the end of it. So VNF2 Ethernet 0 does not have a place to connect to. That is a problem with PCI pass through. Again, you could have you could have multiple NICs for all these things, but again, think in terms of like monetization, right? You want your cores and your NICs to be used ma maximum so that you are getting paying subscribers for those things. Then um, came you know SRIOV, which elegantly solved that problem. Where um, so uh, what it did is like. Um, Again, the, there's another issue with this, right? Uh, with this previous scenario, is that the VNF one may not really need all the 10 gig. It may want, like, you know, say 1.6 gig or something. There's no way to share that 10 gig. It's just like the uh, remaining bandwidth for the 10 gig is just wasted. That is the problem. So SRIO, we solved that elegantly by taking the uh, taking this uh, uh, the physical NIC and creating physical function and virtual functions out of that, right? You, you typically have one physical function which has got all the characteristics of uh, all the registers, all the characteristics of the hardware, whereas the uh, virtual functions, the VFs, which you see VF1 through N, um, those have typically only the receive and the transmit queues. And uh, this is all kind of built, you can think of it like a switch within the, uh, you know, within the, uh, the NIC card itself. Right? This is not really a part of the OS, that's why it's in its own box there. So with this, you, you can still have VNF1, Ethernet 0 connecting to uh, virtual function 1, and VNF2, Ethernet 0 connecting to virtual function 2, and both of them sharing this 10 gig bandwidth and being, uh, getting better you know, uh, throughput, I mean, utilization out of this. Um, one issue with this, I, I already kind of alluded to this earlier, is that the VNFs, VNF1 and VNF2, have to have a driver which, uh, I mean, they have to be, uh, have a driver support for the exact, uh, you know, family of uh, NICs. You know, if it's a X540, whatever it is, it needs that, right? So if, uh, if, if the private cloud changes, they got a new generation of NICs, 
VNFs have to be, uh, you know, uh, reprocessed so that they will have that, that uh, you know, uh, support, which is, which is a problem, which is what we want to go away from, right? Um, this is what DPDK typically looks like. You have uh, a couple of fundamental concepts that you need to understand in DPDK is that DPDK uses something no, known as pole mode driver or PMD. So what it does is there's a polling mechanism of, uh, and another uh, equally important concept is that um, DPDK, OVS DPDK actually is going to reside in user space. There's a, you know, uh, sitting in the user space, it directly is able to, because of other like, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, optimizations such as uh, vhost user and stuff like that, it's directly able to communicate from the VM and uh, bypass the kernel. That is where you get the optimization and the speed. And the pole mode drivers. The pole mode drivers, the way, the way it works is you will need to dedicate like one core to do the, if in, in my case, in my lab, I have like a, a, you know, 40, 48 CPUs, zero through 47. So I will need to dedicate one of them saying like, you shall only be serving this, you know, uh, uh, you know, polling, polling function, right? Um, so it's very important to understand how this thing works because that it's all about in DPDK, the flexibility comes from complexity and the complexity is if you tune it and uh, you know, you go through the extra effort of doing that, then you, you get a pretty good solution that you can use where it's more cloud ready than SRIOV. So in the data, uh, DPDK data plane, the, there are, these are the things to consider. One is the hardware tuning uh, the, uh, what kind of throughput that you can get, what you should expect, uh, the uh, CPU core allocation, and the high availability. We'll go through those things now. So from a hardware tuning point of view, uh, first of all, we talked about zero packet loss. That is uh, fairly important, uh, you know, that we have this high throughput with uh, no packet loss. Right? For that, you will need something, uh, some later hardware generations. You cannot have an older one, it's not supported. There are a lot of like tweaks that are done. Uh, with, if you use uh, a Red Hat Director for installing the OpenStack, a lot of it is done for you. And more and more things, as, in, when, as we go from 10 to 11, 11 to 12 and so on, more and more of these things will be done for you. It will be completely transparent. But you will need to have a hardware like a CPU which supports those things, the generation of CPU. For example, uh, if you're using uh, like uh, uh, in the NFE lab that I work in uses X540 and uh, some of them, uh, the other labs uh, uh, have ordered X, uh, X710. These kind of like, uh, you know, uh, CPUs are required. Secondly, it's also important that you go into BIOS and, you know, kind of disable things like the C3 power state and take all these extra steps that are required. The reason they are required is if you don't do that, it will cause a lot of this local interrupts. If you look at like, uh, you know, the interrupts, you can see, I think it's like slash proc slash interrupts. If you look at that, it will show you all the CPUs and all the interrupts that are associated with the, that CPU, right? And the local interrupts are pretty bad. Uh, I will show you like some charts what it looks like when you, when you have a tuned uh, situation, tuned uh, profile versus a non-tuned profile. I'll show you what it looks like. So it's, this is something that, you know, you'll find even on the OVS, uh, you know, uh, web page. These are things that they recommend saying that you should do these things to get a high performance. So now talking about, um, I know you have a, like a nice picture on the right side, but I would like you to focus on the left side, which is talking about some important things. For the test that was done here to uh, produce these uh, results, uh, you know, the, uh, two, two uh, Vertio net interfaces were used uh, in the VM, and then uh, two 10 gig interfaces were used, and then uh, test PMD was the test tool used. Although we have kind of like uh, uh, developed a new uh, new tool now, uh, our group has developed a new tool called PBench, which is also uh, available for public public consumption. I will show you uh, that and uh, share the link with you. Um, uh, Bidirectional traffic, as well as like uh, you know, um, you know the, the various profiles, right? You can see like uh, on the left column you have the packet sizes. 
if you talk about talk to any service provider, if it's RFI, RFQ, always people will bring up the discussion about 64, the smallest packet size. But in a true iMix, whether it's a mobile network, typically mobile network, everybody uses mobile now, like Netflix, whatever it. In a true, like what you call internet mix, or whatever you want to call it these days, it's a mix of all these packet sizes, 64, 256, 1024, and uh, 1500. In fact, there's a very cool command that I came across, which I've taken the output of, which will show you, for these packet sizes, uh, you know, what were the counters. So you can actually look at that in DPDK. Um, again, if you look at column two, you will see like with 0.002% loss, with 60, I'll just take the 64 byte packet since it's very popular and discussed all the time by, by uh, mobile operators and uh, uh, telcos. So with that, you could get like almost uh, like uh, 12, 12 million packets per second if you had that kind of, if you tolerated that kind of loss, right? But remember, not all traffic is TCP, not everything is going to retransmit, There's a lot of applications are built on UDP, it's just a lot of overhead, you don't want to throw away packets if you can avoid it, right? Um, and then you compare that with like, uh, with 0% uh, packet loss, again, this is, remember, this is for two cores, not for one core, right? Uh, and for two cores, uh, if you now look at uh, column number five, which shows 7.34, that is realistically what you can get, uh, about, approximately about 3.7 million packets per second uh, with per core. That's what you can realistically expect, okay? So, which is a huge improvement over Vertio and getting closer to the cloud-ready uh, cloud ready model. With, uh, with um, SRIOV, you can get close to line rate, you can get like, 9.6, 9 9.3 uh, gigs, gigs per second on a 10 gig interface. Um, again, the, we don't like to talk in terms of GBPS because it really, packet, packet size, frame size comes into play because as you can see, the smaller the frame size, the, you know, the, uh, the lower the GBPS, right? If you can, it's just simple math. You take small packet sizes and you multiply how many millions packets per second, you'll get the, like, GBPS. And large packet sizes, you can get more GBPS, less packets per second. All right? Um, so this is a, a diagram which kind of shows, and the bottom you have the physical cores, zero through three, and um, core zero is being allocated, we do the CPU isolation and say these are the ones which the host can use. Host can use for multiple purposes, right? One is like for nothing to do with housekeeping, some other functions that it's doing, right? Nothing to do with NFV or DPDK, for things like that. You, you, you can set aside CPUs for that. You need to set aside CPU for the pole mode driver which runs on behalf of the like uh, in, in, of, uh, of the host to use, and then uh, the physical CPUs one through three, one, two, and three are given to the uh, VM to use. You can say, I'll show you the configuration parameters in the director which you would set to achieve this. Um, I guess um, no questions so far it should be pretty clear and easy to understand, I guess. Uh, so talking about, yeah. We should wait till the end? Okay, let's wait till the end. All right, so, um, so DPDK HA, uh, the way, you know, we have uh, kind of uh, designed this for the lab and the upcoming uh, reference architecture document, is that um, what I don't show here is like uh, NIC3 and NIC4 are also bonded. That's my network isolation, uh, you know, for all other traffic like uh, uh, internal API, storage, storage management, all of that. And if you're using VXLAN, the tenant, tra tenant traffic which goes from the controller to the compute nodes for the v VXLAN traffic, all of that rides on the bond which is on NIC3 and NIC4. I don't show that here because it's not uh, it, it, it's uh, not uh, uh, out of scope for this. But just I wanted to mention that. NIC5 and NIC6 are dedicated for data plane in, in, in the NFE lab that I work in. What we do here is we bond those two using OVS DPDK bond. 
the DPDK bond, right? And uh, in this example, we show that uh, VM1 DP is also running DPDK, and it's got a pole mode driver, and it poles. Uh, that's the other thing that you have to th consider is that it has to, if if uh, if the DPDK in the user uh, space outside the VM delivers a packet, unless the pole mode driver is active and goes and fetches that packet, you could have like very poor, th poor throughput. So you, both things have to be in sync for this to work well. So in this example, if you have, uh, the way we do it is uh, Ethernet 0 connects to the DPDK bond, NIC 5 connects to switch 3, NIC 6 connects to switch 4. So either if switch 3 or switch 4 fails, you still have at least half the throughput. That is the whole uh, you know, uh, criteria of creating these bonds. Finally, we'll start looking at uh, the troubleshooting uh, part. One is uh, there are three aspects to this. Uh, one is the what, how to install, what are the things to set for installation, and what can go wrong during install, uh, what you can, how you can look at that. Uh, again, from uh, we said HA is important, and we want to use uh, DPDK bonds, and uh, and uh, you know we can we'll show you a command how to look at that. Lastly, we'll look at. Uh, performance related stuff, how to look at it on the node with uh, show commands, uh, how to look at counters, and uh, what are the important things to look for. Hey, how are you, man? Um, mode driver DPDK uh, to enable SRIOB as well. That you sort of made them sound mutually exclusive. Uh, okay, that is. Uh, uh, thanks, Arnesh. So, um, so you're talking about a scenario. There's only one scenario where you would use a pole mode driver in the VM and SRIOV in you know in the on the host. Is that the one you're talking about? Possibly. Yeah, that's the only scenario. There's, otherwise, you don't really need a pole mode driver uh, for SRIOV. So there is a scenario, but I don't know of any uh, NEPs or uh, telcos wanting to use that. Yeah, they are. They are. Okay. We should talk later. I'll, I'll talk at the end. You okay. Yeah. Please pull me in. I'll be happy to discuss that. I mentioned that in my. Uh, they yeah. 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 I know it'll work, but uh, you know whether you. Uh, that's again like going back to the, that doesn't take away the problem of using SRIOV, right? You still need to use SRIOV there. You'll just increase the performance, I guess, from a VM point of view. Yes. Do pull me in. I would like to learn what you guys have done, and yeah, we'll take it offline. Thank you. So, uh, from an installation point of view, uh, again, uh, you know, we use, uh, uh, you know, in, in the lab, uh, we have used recently Red Hat OpenStack Director uh, uh, with the Red Hat OpenStack Platform 10, and uh, these are the, the these are the uh, parameters that are set in network environment.yaml file, uh, which are kind of uh, related to DPDK. Uh, some of them are used for other uh, things as well as, as you'll find similar configurations for uh, SRIOV and other things. But these are the things that I've kind of listed here, saying that you have to kind of configure and touch it for it to work. And the ones that I've highlighted here, if you look at the host CPU list, host CPU list is, can be specified as uh, like, like enumeration like you've done here, or you can give it a range, saying like, for example, you can say, I could have just said like uh, 1 through 47 and just go ahead and use all of them. Or I can select these, which means that uh, like other CPUs like 1 or something else is not really uh, you know, set aside for this purpose. And out of the whole CPU list, again, some of these, you might find some uh, changes as we, uh, like these things are progressing and evolving. The, like how these things are being interpreted and uh, like already I, I'm hearing through my uh, developers that like, uh, developers in, at Red Hat that these things are going to change, how we're going to set this and uh, interpret that to uh, establish the, you know, the tuning is going to, may change in the upcoming releases. But for right now, what it means is uh, you have an entire list specified under host CPU list. So you, you say this is the entire list. Out of that, you say Neutron DPDK core list can use f 4, 6, 20, and 22 out of that list for for uh, for PMD, pole mode driver, right? You can use that, and then you set aside uh, for the vCPU pin is the one which is 
uh, these are the CPUs which are set aside for the uh, VMs to use, the 8, 10, 12, and so on. So together, like, uh, if you think of it, right, the host CPU list is a superset of the uh, Neutron DPDK core list and the Nova vCPU pin list, pin set, sorry. And uh, that can, these, some of this information is available in fact, examples, uh, complete uh, full uh, example sample file of net uh, network environment.yaml and each of these uh, configuration parameters I explained uh, on the uh, customer portal, Red Hat portal. The link is provided here. If somebody wants a PDF copy, I can try to take names and send you a PDF of this uh, uh, you know, presentation later. So during installation, if your install went well, and uh, this is what uh, the you know DPDK setup should OBS DPDK should look look like. In our case, we have a bond, so you will see the port mentioned as DPDK bond zero, and it's got two interfaces, DPDK one and DPDK zero. Right? This is what a healthy installation should look like. Um, there's some interesting things, uh, you know, which you know, you make mistakes in the YAML file and all that, it could lead to some in interesting situations, like having extra space between commas, you know, I thought, you know, that will be ignored, but it's provided, fed into the command line, which fails silently, and you'll never know about it. So those kind of things can happen to you, but, you know, if, it, if it's healthy, everything went well, this is what it looks like, okay? Uh, the type DPDK is important because, uh, you know, uh, the non-DPDK non one. Uh, by the way, this is referred to as um, OVS user bridge versus OVS bridge. OVS bridge is the one which you would normally use outside uh, the DPDK you know, environment. So how, this is a, if you want to check like what OVS DPDK options are being set, you can go cat this file. After the install is done, you can go cat this file. Uh, etc sysconfig open uh, open vswitch and you will see all the dpdk options there right uh, there's also like there's some uh, like uh, this file whether it gets used or not it also depends on which ovs version that you're using 2.5 uh, uses this and restarts ovs and uh, 2.6 uh, reads out of some sort of a database is what i was told so anyway i mean you can go get this file and you'll find that information there um, this is kind of what it looks like when DPDK was not set up and you had some sort of error, like this is one scenario, this could, there's another scenario that uh, we ran into but have not captured that. So this is like, uh, what happened was there's kind of a race condition and uh, because of which, uh, you know, uh, the DPDK, like I said, like I fat fingered and put a space between uh, like to uh, parameters which are fed to OVS on a command line. So obviously in a command line you can't have like spaces. It buffed and silently did not install DPDK, but that's what the output looked like. Um, you want to talk about this? Yeah, this DPDK dev bind is a pretty handy tool to, uh, to bind and unbind devices. Uh, and also checks the status, uh, which means that if something goes wrong, even in the very beginning when you are taking the DPDK into use, it's worthwhile checking that whether you have the interface even created or not. Thank you, Eva. Um, we talked about like how we have used the bonding for DPDK and the way to look at the bonds uh, is you do a command OVS app CTL bond slash show and the actual bond name in this case is uh, DPDK bond zero. From that you can see all the details, the most important being that the DPDK one is the active slave. And um, so, you know, when we did a failover test, we actually went and failed the active, uh, you know, the, the switch side of the active link uh, and uh, tried to see whether it fails over to the, you know, standby and stuff like that. Um, the other thing to notice is like the bond mode right now is balanced TCP. LACP is going to be supported shortly, I think, in uh, OpenStack 11. Uh, is that right? I think, uh, I forget the details, but I can easily find that out for you if someone emails me. 
later on like you normal LACP will be supported right now it is not supported with uh, uh, this one. So, you have to use uh, if you want uh, LACP you have to use uh, uh, balance uh, balance TCP as the mode. Uh, sorry when I say LACP is supported it will be 802.3 AD which will be supported ok. Um, then comes the kind of the final part of this presentation which is the you know troubleshooting uh, things to look for in performance and uh, there is two aspects of it things which you can look at on the node and measurements that would be interesting both it is not just from a troubleshooting perspective of course like making sure like your uh, Rx and Tx counters are going up, drops are not going up things like that are obviously useful, but also if there is some way you can use it to maybe graph something or use it for stats that is also important. Um, here are some of the commands that uh, I got to use in the lab and uh, you know, so you can you can grab a tune D in the HC tune D boot command line it will show you the like the uh, the host CPU list which was used right. So, this is the one that uh, because of tuning this is what is provided so that at boot time these CPUs are set aside for the host. Second one is uh, you uh, this the in the OpenStack director installation it creates this file called uh, CPU partitioning variables dot conf and that will also have like uh, you know what uh, CPUs are being set aside for the host. And lastly you can uh, grab a vCPU on the HC nova dot conf and we will show you the vCPU pen list right. These are the things that are useful to look at. Um, so, this example is taken from a uh, output of a lab which is like not there is a dynamic lab where, where we use it for performance this is not a, a from my lab, but this is very interesting data. So, I thought I will share this with you. So, if you take a look at like this is graphing the uh, like local interrupts like I told you right like you can you can actually cat or vi proc uh, slash proc, proc slash interrupts and you will see it is a huge very long file it is like uh, one line runs into one single uh, row runs, runs into many lines and you know and it is kind of hard to view it visually, but what they have done is like they built a tool that p bench tool that I talked about and that uh, tool is available on github and I provided the link at the bottom. So, you can go grab that and this readme files and stuff like that. They use that for a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, testing as well as tuning uh, stuff. So, here you if you see notice I have highlighted CPU uh, 17 in that like uh, radio box or whatever you want to call it and that is showing that the average local interrupts are approximately 1000 per second which is very high that means it is doing something you should only get 2 interrupts one for the pole mode driver one for the VM if you have tuned your CPU right. If you do not tune your t CPU this is what it will look like. So, you, you may have run some you know like installation thinking everything is great and then you use your traffic generator and you are not getting the performance these are the kind of things that you need to look at. And here is the example of uh, like um, CPU which has been tuned now I have selected CPU 1 and uh, uh, CPU 1 from that radio box and you can see that the average number of uh, uh, local timer interrupts is, uh, is 2 close to 2 right. Again this is not the only thing you can also look at like uh, um, var log I think I show that like uh, var log uh, tune d dot log and you will see that like you know the it has actually attempted to do the partitioning and things like that you can look at that. And bunch of useful commands are captured here for sake of reference uh, like uh, first of all this one is the one which displays the packet counters and the drops. I have highlighted receive transmit and drops these are things which you can quickly look at like you make sure your receive Rx and Tx is constantly incrementing and drops are not. Sometimes once uh, there are transitions you can expect drops even in you know hardware based uh, solutions you will see certain drops they are transient drops we tend to ignore them. The more important thing to pay attention is 
drops should not continuously go up and there should not be large numbers. That is very important. Uh, this is again, I mean, the, uh, this is sake of reference. I have provided this, but you know, this is not something that uh, no, at least I have not used this a lot, but it gives you kind of correlation between the port numbers and the port names, uh, so you, you can make the connection. Uh, this is this is a very interesting command. I alluded to this earlier. This gives you like based on packet sizes, right? Like uh, packet range is 128 through to 255. That's the RX queue, and 64 1 through 64 small packet sizes is in that receive queue, and so on. It gives you counters per packet size, which is very cool because you can kind of uh, interpolate, extrapolate, and figure out like the traffic mix also, right? Pretty cool command. Uh, and lastly, this gives you like uh, the displays the PMD port allocation, uh, like uh, to show you that Numa Numa node one is where like you know the cores 14 and 15 are being used. Right. I think that's all I had. Uh, if you have any questions, we can take them now. Um, so, TCP dump is not available with DPDK because it works at kernel mode. But there is a utility that replaces TCP dump, and that's all I know. Can you explain a bit about how you do TCP dump like troubleshooting in a DPDK environment? Okay. First of all, for uh, sake of transparency, I ran into the exact same problem. We ran into the exact same problem. We wanted to see like packets. You know, I love to see packets from the source all the way to the destination. Every every hop of the way, I like to see that. And I quickly found out that TCP dump doesn't work. In fact, if you do a, a IP link show, it will not even the links don't even show up in in that output, right? So there is actually a OBS TCP dump. I'm being told by uh, Flavio, I think, and uh, Red Hat, who's like, uh, you know, uh, kind of a guru in this area. He said that you can use that, and that will show you all the output. But if you do a normal deploy using a, a Red Hat OpenStack director, you don't get that. What I understand is you may have to kind of build your own DPDK, and there's like a tools directory in that. From that, you can start using that. I think that OBS TCP dump will be available. I've not had time in the last month to uh, dig into this, but uh, if you leave me your email address, when I find out, I can share it with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, to add to that, you might consider also trying a port mirror uh, within, again, within that. The, the key there is that anything that DPDK pull mode driver software is, is utilizing, any interface that's been assigned to it, no longer uses a normal Linux kernel mode driver. So TCP dump, of course, deals with kernel interfaces. Uh, excellent slides. <clears throat> I recommend everybody in the room do get these guys' email addresses and ask for these slides. This is golden information. Can you go back to the install slide with all the vCPU variables? There are some bits here I want to point out to everybody that is absolutely critical in understanding high-performance VNF compute nodes. This. Um, so this is a hyper-threaded system, you can tell by the numbering. The other thing, there's another session that was earlier today, find the slides and recording. Numa node alignment, CPU pinning, one gig huge pages, all of these things work alongside DPDK to enable not only DPDK if you're deploying it at your host level, which is what we've been covering in this session, but for any other use case for VNS as well. Uh, having one gig huge pages, nice neat blocks of RAM, having NUMA node alignment is critical, and this is on a NUMA node system. If you, the short version is if you have a multi-socket system, you have two motherboards that are connected via a, a QPI interconnect, like a bus. So every time you map a port, you want to map your CPUs and your RAM to the same side of the motherboard, the same NUMA node that, that your, your, uh, whatever your transport mechanism is. So excellent stuff here. This slide alone is, is worth everybody reaching out to you for the slides. Uh, the other thing on performance that is always alarming the first time people run into it is the apparent CPU utilization of the pull mode driver. If you go and monitor 100. just, 
you know, your typical NMS guys are going to go, oh, you installed this thing and all of a sudden my utilization is 100% on these cores. And no, no, really, it's a pull mode driver which is doing what it says. It's pulling constantly for packets to be sent or received out of port. So that's a false positive, maybe, yeah, way to yeah. describe it, until you knock people to settle down. Uh, but yeah, if you're still running classic OVS, you are failing your company, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you for the comments. Just to follow up uh, to what you said, does it make sense to actually uh, track or measure the processing cycles for DPDK and the polling cycles for DPDK separately so it gives a sense that, okay, how much of the CPU cycles are being used for processing packets? Great question. Uh, no, do not do that. Um, those CPUs that you're allocating to anything running DPDK, whether it's the many, many vendor-provided VNFs that, that employ DPDK within their own data planes, um, or whether it's DPDK and open vSwitch, those cores are dead to you. They are gone. They are allocated for forwarding. You will not be using them for any other purpose. You should not want to use them for any other purpose. They are giving you much greater functionality in your environments. So don't, don't even bother tracking. Those, core, those cores are gone. I understand. What I meant was that is there any way to find out that the CPU core allocation or CPU, CPU cores allocated to a VNF are pegging to the threshold and that is the reason why the performance is limited or that's the bottleneck for your performance. How, how do you do that? Okay, so let's say we were comparing classic OVS to OVS DPDK. That's a good context for your question. Um, M total number of packets per second throughput is what you should look for. Because if you're running OVS, on a good day you're getting 1.1 million packets per second and you're done for the host. The rest of your host is sitting idle. Core is doing nothing. So packets per second is the threshold that you're looking for. Um, as soon as you go to here, his chart's already covered all of that. I mean, even, even lightly tuned, the DPDK enabled OVS is going to decimate that. Regarding coexistence, shortest possible version of this, um, using OpenStax scheduler filters, uh, groups of compute nodes that have ports allocated for SRIOV, and groups of compute nodes that have, uh, well, anything running OVS should have D DPDK enabled OVS, but those hosts coexist in the scheduler filters, do a very nice job of picking where your workloads go. So if you're a telco and part of your job is to schedule um, you know, various Cisco, Juniper, Brocade, whatever, V routers, right, firewalls, load balancers that are compiled with DPDK, they will benefit from running on top of vSwitch and you retain the flexibility that our speakers have mentioned. Uh, they benefit more if you can afford to give them uh, Newman node uh, CPU pin and, and, and one gig cube pages to those SROV enabled interfaces. So the rest of your commodity oversubscribed compute load should be on top of these nodes without any question whatsoever. Okay, so guys. coexistence works great. You guys choose what your business needs are to determine where this workflow work go. I'm being signaled that you know we are run out of time. So can we take your question offline or maybe l last question? Make it quick. Maybe it's the last question. Okay. Thank you so much for attending. There's also like a reference ar architecture uh, that we put out. There are two of them. One uh, called, uh, you know, deploying uh, uh, mobile networks using NFE, something like that. And the second one is going to be using OpenStack 10. So look forward to that on uh, access.redhat.com under uh, reference architectures.